What will be the capacity of the pods in terms of weight and of people? Um, we can't disclose figures for the weight. We can say it's under two tons, and uh, but that's about it. And there's going to be two pilots and four passengers per per flight. Of course, some customers may want to book it just for two, which is also possible. But the the baseline baseline design is to have two pilots and and four four passengers. Why two pilots? Um, well, we want to have somebody always looking at the instruments, and we want to have somebody taking care of the passengers. You may want to be served tea or some other beverage, or I think the pilots have an enormous role to play in this long two-hour trip at, at float. They can mediate, just like when you go and see uh, an excavation in Egypt, it's much more interesting if you go with a guy that may have a PhD exactly on the thing that is being excavated and can also em explain and get to the right level of, of detail that, that, the, that the customer wants. That, those are the things that we're expecting from, from our pilots. It's not just for the safety, which is co of course is important. And, and having to, it's on, uh, something that insurers like as well. We saw it with a very light jet market the VLGs, like, like uh, the Eclipse at the time, um, uh, it, was, it was much uh, easier to, to get, to get uh, the right insurance if w you were showing that there were two pilots, even though you had some backup methods and way to pilot things from, from a certain distance or on autopilot. Uh, insurance likes to see redundancy in all things and also on that. What are the dimensions of the pod and the, and the sail or the balloon? Um, the, the, the pod is, is about four and a half meters di of diameter. And an average American male can stand up on, on it, uh, just barely. And the, the balloon itself, the sail, it's like 120 meters of diameter. Um, I should check what that makes in feet. But it's a pretty large gas bag, yeah. Describe the ascent and the, and the science behind it. Uh, balloons uh, operate with very simple physics laws. The Archimedes principle, so it's buoyancy. You average density is less than that of the, of the air that surrounds you, so you, you, you lift uh, gently. It doesn't go very fast up. It takes about three hours to reach float altitude. And as you go up, you will see the sky getting darker and darker and darker. And more stars and planets popping up in the, in the, in the, in the dark blue and then the black of, of space. And the, the Earth below, um, it's what becomes blue. Uh, you are leaving the blue below you. And, and the atmosphere glows with a really beautiful electric blue. And you, you can see the curvature of the Earth getting uh, more and more uh, pronounced as, as you go up. Uh, that's, uh, that's how the ascent will be. And uh, there's winds, but usually what happens is that the balloon matches the speed of the wind. So it basically changes your speed respect to the ground, but you don't feel the winds much during the flight. So it's a very gentle and silent journey through our atmosphere up to its uh, outer edges. What about, what about safety? Safety is, is absolutely critical for what we're doing. We, want, we don't want just to do this for a couple of times. We want to do this on a repeated fashion and, and it has to be very safe uh, for the, so, so that the customers are happy and there's a business case for us. And, and um, my, my actual background is more in rocketry. I worked on the Ariane 5, I worked on electric propulsion as well and I love rockets, but I just happen to think that at this stage of development, it's a safer bet to fly on a, on a high altitude balloon than it is on a, on a high altitude rocket. For several reasons, there's no high speed re-entry, there's no explosives on board. Those things are prone to failure modes that are pretty catastrophic and they are difficult to mitigate. And with our system, we can put 
triple redundancy and dissimilar redundancy and be in pretty good shape for anything strange that, that, may, that may happen on a flight. Uh, there is a reason also why don't we go much higher than 36 kilometers. The physics allow it and there's uh, combinations of, of systems that could let you go say to 40 kilometers for instance. Um, but there's really no point from a visual point of view you will get the same sort of view and going higher just makes it more difficult in some of the scenarios of, of getting back safely. So, so we've, we think we're at a very good compromise in terms, of, in terms of safety. Well, you mentioned redundancy, but what happens if the balloon pops? Well, you see, you, uh, some of these balloons are, sim very similar balloons are used uh, for scientific purposes and sometimes they, 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 they've gotten out of control and, and some fighter jets have, have chased these, these balloons and they, they, blah, 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 they shoot the, through, the, through the balloon and the balloon kept flying no problem, even though it was being shot by, by a, uh, a machine gun from a, for a, from a fighter jet. Because they are incredibly robust and their rip stop, you can blow a hole like this. Since they are so big, what's gonna happen is that the air from outside is going to mix with the helium, so you lose a little buoyancy, but you might be able even to do the flight with a, with a big hole. But um, anyway, uh, the, the way that we think is safest to land is not with a balloon, but it's, with, uh, it's disengaging from the balloon and, and coming back down like the Chinese, the Soyuz, the Mercury, the Apollo, like Dragon, with like they, they're often called textile-based decelerators or parachutes. Fancier or less fancy, but that's, that's how, how you want to come back from extreme altitudes and have everything under control. And that's, um, that's how we, we return. So the, the, balloon, the balloon, you can do anything you want to the balloon, it won't make any difference in the safety of the crew.